Welcome to the Westside Investors Network. Win your community of investing knowledge for growth. This is the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast for real estate professionals by real estate professionals. This show is focused on the next step in your career, investing. Thank you for listening. And please, if you like our content, rate us on your podcast provider. Just a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are for educational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any shares or securities, make or consider any investments or take any other action. And now, AJ and Chris Shepard. Our next guest is one of the newest mentoring students of the Michael Blanc's DealMaker program. He is the founder and principal of Rubicon Properties and one of the youngest to start his real estate investing journey, particularly in syndication. Here to share about his investing at a young age and the steps he's taking to close that first multifamily deal. Please welcome Alex Mandaro. All right. Today we have Alex Mandaro on with us. He is founder and principal of Rubicon Properties. Alex, great to have you on the show. Do you want to just like take a little minute and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, sure. It's a pleasure to be here. So a little bit about myself. I am 18, so I'm very, very young relatively for the space. And about a year ago, I picked up Michael Blanc's book, Financial Freedom with Real Estate Investing. And I kind of just, I was opened up to a whole new world that I didn't even know existed. I knew that there were, you know, people who flipped houses, real estate agents and all that. But when I found out that syndication was an option, I kind of blew my mind. And so a year of learning, knowledge, all that. And I kind of got to where I am today, where I've just been soaking up as much as I can. And I've decided that I want to pursue real estate syndication full time. And so that's really where I'm at right now. I live in Florida, so it's nice and sunny here. And that's what I got. That is awesome. So you're 18 years old and you're ready to do it. And Michael Blanc is your guru? Essentially. Okay. Very cool. So what was it exactly that drew you to real estate investing? And I mean, Michael Blanc, you're hoping to dive into syndication. Is that correct? Yes. I'm going to say one thing. I'm not entirely sure what brought me here. I know that for a long time since I was a kid, I've always liked the idea of just like owning a building, right? The idea of like, oh, I own that. That's cool. But I think that syndication was kind of just something that I stumbled upon and I thought, how is this possible? Because, you know, the preconceived notion, you need a lot of money to get into real estate. That's what I always thought. You know, if you want to invest in real estate, you have to have money first. But now something that has been opened up to me is, well, you don't need your own, you need money, but you don't need your own money and you can go raise that money. And so for someone who doesn't have a lot of money to start out, it's a pretty revolutionary idea. Cool. Well, do you want to tell us a little bit like kind of how far along are you and where you are at in your journey towards getting, I think, getting the first deal, right? Yep. So I'm not quite there yet. I'm close though. Like I'm ready to go once the first deal kind of comes along my path. I'm more of the, you know, acquisitions and underwriting and analysis side. And so I've worked, met a couple of partners actually that are handle the other sides of it better than I do. I've just found that if I focus on my strengths, it just works out better for everybody because then I get to do my thing really well and I get to team up with someone who does their thing really well. And so right now we're just looking for a deal to invest in. Anything yes. between 50 and 150 units, preferably in the South East. Preferably close to where you're at, maybe. <laughs> that would be nice. Cool. Well, how are you going about trying to find those deals? Yeah. So it's almost entirely through commercial brokers. So just, I'm, um, you know, Looking at LoopNet, yeah, but there's not a lot of great stuff on LoopNet. And so what's really been cool is getting on all the broker mailing lists. And I just get deals upon deals upon deals. And most of them don't meet my criteria. So I kind of have to filter them out. But the ones that do kind of check the boxes, I then kind of go deeper on those and then dig even deeper when I find something that works. Nice. How are you developing those relationships with those brokers? And how are you finding them? It's all about like the little touches, I think. So, you know, send an email here, phone conversation there, going for tours, stuff like that is what really helps in my opinion. And then it also really helps to know what you're talking about because if the broker gets any whiff of you being unprofessional or a novice, it's kind of going to turn them off and say, okay, maybe we don't want to deal with this buyer because they don't seem very serious. 
So, I mean, you are kind of a more of a novice and less experienced. Like, what does one of those conversations look like so that you portray, I guess, the amount of experience or that sort of thing to the broker? Right. So I think the biggest thing has been borrowing experience. And so where I fall short, I can just kind of turn it over to my partners or my mentors where I can say, yeah, my mentor has, you know, over a thousand units and we're working together on this. And so you have them on my team. And then the other half of it is like knowing what you're talking about. So I I already kind of said that, but it's knowing the terms, knowing the lingo almost so that when you're talking to the broker, it's, they kind of feel like you've been at it for a while, even though you might not have been. Nice. What's been your best way of like kind of learning and getting that information so that you're able to quote unquote, speak to speak, right? I've read a bunch of books. I like reading. So books are kind of my strength. I've done a couple courses. It's just been, you know, pulling from as many avenues as possible. YouTube is good. Podcasts are good. Anywhere I can get, you know, another perspective or another opinion, especially with someone who's got experience, that's been really helpful. So Alex, one of your goals is financial freedom, correct? Yes. So do you have like goals set towards achieving that, like maybe annual goals or maybe like a big long-term goal? Yeah, I do actually. A couple of people have asked me like, what does financial freedom mean? Because I think it's really subjective for whatever position you're in. And so me being, you know, a young bachelor, I don't have many (laughs) things to take care of. And so right now it's probably around $5,000 a month and I could take care of everything and I could live comfortably wherever I want right now. But I think long-term, I'm thinking a little bit bigger than that not only to how much impact I want to have on teaching others, but on, you know, financial goals. And so what I really like to see in my life is by the time I'm 30, so 12 years, 5,000 units under management. Okay. And basically syndicated. And so I guess with that 5,000 under management with in the business of syndication, you're going to be selling properties like, and over the course of 12 years, you'll have most indications are three to five years hold time. So that seems either like a lot of deal flow or very large property sizes. What do you think? Like, I guess, how do you think you're going to get there? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I actually got the exact same question a couple of days ago. One of my friends was like, you know, you're going to have to sell it at some point. And I was like, yeah, I, I realize that. And so it's a combination of me expecting that at some point my deal flow is going to get better when I, you know, have some experience under my belt. And then other parts of it is, yes, property sizes are going to be bigger. That's really where I want to be long term. But it's way harder to kind of show that you have experience when you're about to sign a contract on 300 units versus 50 units, because you're dealing with a different sophistication level of the sellers. And so they look for a lot more on the higher side. Yeah, very interesting. And so when you talk about $5,000 per month as an 18 year old, are you talking about passive income? Or are you talking about, you know, there's passive income, and then there's actively working for it income? I think it's a combination of both, because I don't see myself retiring in the next 10 years. And so I can really, you know, technically, I would say that my first deal could probably take care of my initial financial goals, given it, if it's the correct size, you know, above a certain number of units. So do you want to break that down a little bit? I mean, you have partners. So how would you expect to get $5,000 a month of income from the first deal? Right. So right now we kind of arranged our split. We decided that this is our split for whatever deals we work on in the future, we just kind of jive the right way, I guess. And so because we're looking at a size above 50 units, we're just splitting it, you know, whatever the equity split is. And then there's a bunch of different things that come into what is your income? So there's acquisition fees, cash flow, asset management fees, depending on who ends up dealing with that disposition fees. And then obviously the appreciation that you get. And so averaged out all those things put together, I think it's pretty reasonable to estimate that $5,000 a month. Yeah. When you sell, that's kind of like what AJ and I are finding on our deals is that most of our income gets pushed out 
until it's sold. And that's kind of because we have a waterfall system. So I guess a fee structure and the asset management fee is relatively small compared to the property size. Or I mean, I guess just the rest of the income. So there's a certain amount of risk too, right? Like I'm assuming that you guys are probably have some sort of hurdle where if you get over a certain amount, then you're getting more as the sponsor and the GP, right? Right. It's a deal by deal basis. So we're kind of deciding how we want the waterfall or the equity split to go, depending on the size of the deal, what the returns look like before and after that. So we have options. And now here's a word from our sponsor. Get things done while you're on the move. Learn more about working with a virtual assistant through offsite professionals. It's a great way to get all the things done that you need to get done. Have freedom in your time and streamline your life by automating your business. Stop spending time on the tasks that you can delegate and start spending more time on your superpower. Call us today at 503 446-3177 446-3177 or visit our website at offsiteprofessionals.com. So I think my question my brother is really kind of curious about is like, how do you anticipate getting $5,000 of cash flow if you're waiting until the end of the deal to receive the money? Right. So that's where in that case, it wouldn't necessarily be the first deal, but it might be a you know combination of a couple deals, two, three, where after my split of the GP, that becomes a combination of $5,000 a month. Cool. I mean, I think that's awesome. So I guess here's another question for you. Have you read Scott Trench's book, Set for Life? I have not. It is a good one. And it kind of describes the scenario of like how someone can get out of their job and into a situation like where you're at, where you're striving after exponential, you know, financial growth, whereas somebody who's working in a job, you know, they have linear at best financial growth in that job. And so his premise was kind of like, all right, you need to have, you know, six months of living costs and it might've been 18 months, but essentially slash your budget, be able to live on nothing and then get 18 months of runway And then you can either like start a company or try investing in real estate and syndication or, you know, take a job where you have significant upside, whether it's a sales job or, and so how did you find yourself in this enviable position and how did you get to where you are? I mean, it is amazing, like to just have this opportunity to go after what you're going. Yeah, I really, I understand that like where I come from is pretty rare. And so it's kind of come from the understanding that because I am so young, I have plenty of time to take risks now while the consequences are lower. And so that's just what I plan on doing. I I have plenty of time to go and if I want to go find a job and then work my way up there, should all else fail. But for now, I think I see myself taking those risks while I still can. And I guess, like, how are you supporting yourself, like, during this time? Well, I still live with my family. So, okay. It supports myself pretty well, which is something that I have that a lot of other people don't have. So, you know, it's something that I just have, which I'm lucky to have. Cool. So back to kind of like goals, like, do you have a timeline on which you want to get your first deal done? And Like what kind of like, I guess, steps are you taking to ensure that that happens? Well, ideally I'd have my first deal like today. So, but that's not realistic right now. It's just a lot of filtering through that mailing list, looking at as many properties as possible, and then getting as many through the filter as I can that, you know, get past initial underwriting and dig a little deeper. As long as I have properties and investments flowing in front of my eyes and I'm going through them. I'm comfortable that within the next year, unless something drastic happens, I feel like I could get something under contract. Okay. How many deals are you looking at a day? How many different markets? Like kind of break down some metrics for us so that our listeners can kind of understand like what sort of work does it take to kind of like drop your job or get into syndication as an acquisitions 
So you're, you're doing mostly acquisitions, right? It's, mostly acquisitions because yeah. I've just found that that works best for me. Well, it's a, it's a great way to start. I mean, low capital investment and it's really your time being invested and you're sitting right. there underwriting deals and plugging numbers in and, you know, probably go visiting the properties and, you know, checking stuff out, right? Yeah. So I'd say the investment, it's probably, it really doesn't take that many because there's also a limited supply right now. And so there's only so many you can take a look at, especially where I'm. In. So in the Southeast, things aren't on the market for very long if it's a good deal. And so what you basically, I get maybe five emails a day with investment properties coming from brokers, LoopNet, whatever it might be. I just kind of have alerts set so that once something meets my criteria, it gets sent to me. And then from there, I don't always do the underwriting line because if something I just know, like, oh, it's in this market or in this part of town, it might not make sense for me to dig deeper because I know that I will invest in it anyway. And so I'm not entirely sure what the time commitment is. It's probably a couple hours a day that I do, but it could be less and you would still be able to find the deal, I would say. Have you thought about like going to other markets so that you turn that five deals a day into 25 deals a day? I've thought about it and I've already expanded past what I was expecting. Originally, I was thinking, well, I'm just going to stick to Florida, but that really causes problems because Florida is very hot right now. And so I've had to branch out to the whole Southeast really to expand that deal flow. And I would say that I would want to expand further, but the problem is eventually you go too wide and you can't go deep enough. And so it becomes hard to keep track of all those markets and what's going on in those markets, you know, on the day-to-day -day level. Yeah. Well, and all those relationships too, like every market, you probably have five to 10 different relationships with brokers, right? Right. Actually, that's a really good question is what do you do to keep track of all of those relationships? And like, do you use a CRM or use an Excel, like kind of like breakdown for us? Like, tell us how, like you say you meet a new connection, like, uh, or you're looking for new connections. Like, tell us, how do you do it? Well, I've actually gotten pretty good at this lately. It's something I've been working on and I kind of, I keep Google contacts, like my contacts are all synced between everything. And I'm very diligent about keeping details in those contacts. So I know where that broker is, what we last talked about. If we discussed any like personal things like hobbies, stuff like that, it all goes in there. And so that the next time I see that contact, I know kind of where we're at and where we stand and also have them kind of grouped together so that if I type in Tampa in my contacts, I can find all my broker contacts in Tampa. And then the same for property managers, lending, all those different aspects. How are you keeping track of what's going on in the market in terms of rents and trends and appreciation? So a lot of that is just looking at properties and then having those conversations. So speaking to property managers in the area because they know the areas pretty well that they operate in, if you find a good one, obviously. And so by keeping up those conversations often on a you know, week to week basis, you get a sense for how things are moving and where rents are going, vacancy, occupancy, all those things in tandem. You mentioned a good property manager. What makes a good property manager? Well, we recently discovered that one of the biggest qualities is that they will tell you to not do a deal if it's a bad deal. And I think that that was something that most people don't think about initially because the property manager is in the game to make money, just like everyone is. And so there are some property managers that might say, oh, this is a good deal. We can definitely achieve that because they want to get your business. But if you can find one that's going to say, I think you should just wait for the next one. This one doesn't really look too great. They're willing to turn down that initial business for the long-term relationship. And I think that really speaks well for their business as a whole. A couple other things are communication, in my opinion. They should be able to underwrite decently and they should know their market well. How are you identifying property managers? I mean, it sounds like you're in, looking in multiple different markets. So there's probably multiple different people like how do you go about finding those contacts? A lot of it is referral based. So people I know, I'll just reach out to them and say, hey, do you have any property manager contacts in this area? The best property manager I've found so far, they operate in Florida. I just Googled property managers in Florida and I went to their website and kind of 
did the contact form. And they have been an absolute pleasure to work with. Other than that, it's been, you kind of filter through. So when you're looking at an offering memorandum, a lot of times it'll list the property managers on the competing properties. And so you can just reach out to those and, you know, get a feel for them. So Alex, I mean, you have unlimited time and, you know, unlimited potential. How do you structure or how do you decide what to do? And how do you decide like how to structure your day or your week or your month? A lot of it is just kind of keeping a calendar. I'm a sucker for index cards. I go through so many index cards and they're just littered all over my desk, like with big red lettering, like this is what's going on today. This has to get done first. And so a lot of it is I make sure that if you know something pops up into my head, I write it down immediately so I don't forget. And then I'll kind of plan that out on my calendar saying, okay, this is when this happens and then so on after that. Interesting. And was there anything that like kind of guided you in how you were going to structure that, whether it was a book or a mentor or, you know, what's kind of the philosophy behind the index cards and that way to do scheduling? I think the index cards were kind of just a trial and error thing because I've tried to keep a notebook or a daily planner and it never works out for me. I'll buy one and be like, oh, I'm about to get into this. It's going to go really great. And I'll use it for like a week. And like, this is terrible. I keep the book closed and I don't see anything. It has to like pop out of my face. As for books that recommended that, there's been a couple that I really like. Atomic Habits by James Clear. Love that book. It is so good because it's really about building the habits of doing stuff like that. I can't really think of any else off the top of my head, but there are definitely a few books that I've read, but it's mostly the trial and error kind of thing. I think if I remember correctly, there's a book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, and he recommends the index cards as well. So I was wondering. I also also think Eat That Frog is kind of along those lines too, of being productive and creating lists and organizing. I haven't read Eat That Frog, but I read Think and Grow Rich, and it's possible. I feel like that might have been where I got that from, and I just (laughs) forgot about that. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, you've got a really exciting journey. I'm kind yeah, of we're, we're stoked for you. See, see where you go. Should we get on to the last four questions? Absolutely. All right. I'll start us off with the first one, which is <laughs> not really applicable because you're not. <laughs> uh, no, it might be. <laughs> not 25 yet, but what's one piece of advice you would give to your 25 year old self? Actually, I thought about this. You know, I like to think ahead. And so it's actually a good question, even for someone younger than 25, because I think that if you want to stay on track, you have to tell yourself things, whether that be now or your future self. And so what I would say is kind of take time to slow down because a lot of times, you know, I'm young and so I can get really caught up in the day to day, like, oh, I'm going to achieve these business goals or I'm going to build a really big, cool business. But a lot of times you get lost in that and you forget the really cool things that happen because you're still young and you can still have fun and, you know, go places and do things. So I'd say probably slow down and take time to do that. Awesome. All right. Well, I mean, you're 18. And so what was your first entrepreneurial endeavor? This is one of my favorite questions because I love getting to tell the story. I used to spend my summers in Long Island. And, you know, made a couple friends. We used to hang out in this, it was like an RV resort type park thing. And so there was a bunch of other kids around and I wanted to make a lemonade stand, but, you know, lemonade stands are kind of boring as they are. And so I made a full service lemonade stand with delivery and everything. And I had like four employees running it. (laughs) It was a pretty elaborate operation, but I think that, you know, that was kind of just how my mind ran. And so going from, you know, simple little lemonade stand, like a dollar a glass to now this whole big operation was just something that intrigued me. That's really cool. Yeah. AJ? The next question is, how has your formal and informal training shaped your journey? I would say that my formal training hasn't, I don't know that I've had much formal training because I don't have much to go off of. Other than, you know, I've been working as a part-time bookkeeper for like five years now since I was 13. That's definitely helped because now I kind of use that 
in my underwriting. I don't think I would be as good at underwriting if I didn't have that experience from before. But other than that, it's really been getting to talk to people who have more experience than me. And I would say that's more on the informal training side where I get to ask questions and bounce ideas off of them. And that's been really helpful for guiding me in the direction that I wanted to go. Okay. And our final question, what was your biggest mistake and what did you learn? My biggest mistake was trying to be the do-it-all guy. I know it's like specifically in syndication, right? So the idea that, well, if I just do all the roles of the syndication, I get to keep all the equity. So I raise the capital, I underwrite, I deal with the lawyers and just everything from start to finish. But that's really not sustainable, especially starting out, because really the best benefit you get from partnering is someone to kind of split the load with And then you can focus on what you're good at and they can focus on what they're good at. And so I learned that I have to partner with someone. It just works out better. I then have someone that I can bounce ideas off with and we can work together to achieve the same goal, but we can go further because we're going together. That's a great bit of knowledge. Little divide and conquer two or one plus one is more than two. So Alex, it's been great. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it. And We very much look forward to your future endeavors. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. And if any of our listeners want to reach out to you, do you want to share some contact information? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm mostly active on Instagram. I do real estate, social media content. So you can find me at last name, first name, Mandero Alex. That's really where I'm most active. And then you can reach out to me by email if you want to. It's alex at rubiconproperties.com. And I'm also on LinkedIn. LinkedIn's, I've been getting more active on LinkedIn. Same handle, Mandero Alex. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate having you on. All right. Thank you so much. Well, I'm looking forward to the update, you know, maybe in a year or two, we'll do a deal, deep dive together. Absolutely. On that first one. (laughs) Cheers. Bye guys. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast on WIN, your community of investing knowledge for growth. We hope that this episode has increased your knowledge and added value to your path to freedom. If you would, please take a second to rate us so that we can get more great investors to interview. If you or someone that you know wants to be on, please visit westsideinvestors.com and fill out our form to be on the show. Thank you again and enjoy your day.